Hello and welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. The channel is for you if you want to work with animals. We conduct interviews with animal industry professionals who share their insights into how they became successful working with animals. So perhaps you are a student or perhaps you are in mid-career, you want to know what opportunities are out there, watch the videos uh, to gain those insights. Today, we are joined by David Rampley. David is a successful wildlife artist and he is also head falconer at the North Devon Birds of Prey Centre. David joins us now to share his story and insights. David, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Hi, Charles. It's very nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk. I like it's Thank nice. You. Thank you very much, David. <laughs> so, David, you are, as I said, a wildlife artist. You're also a head falconer. Please, can you describe your career trajectory? How did you come? To be where you are today. Wow, well, it's a uh, it's quite a long story, and I see it starts, I guess, when I was a, when I was a boy. Um, I grew up on a council estate in rural Suffolk uh, with my mother and seven brothers and sisters. So I was the eldest of the lot, and of course, and how the house was chaos. So I spent as much time as I possibly could just out on my own um, in the countryside. And I can remember really the seed, the first seed was planted when I would pinch a few crusts of bread from, uh, there wasn't a lot of bread to go around, but I'd pinch a few bits and go down and feed the ducks now and again. And I can remember seeing what I know now to be a male chaffinch uh, that landed right in amongst us and the ducks. And I had never seen such a beautiful bird in all my life. And I was fairly convinced that somebody must have lost an exotic bird somewhere. And I'd... And I was just old enough to join the library, the local library. And I went there that very afternoon, got myself a book on about birds. And that was it. That was really, that was the root of all. And ever since then, I have been obsessed with birds of one kind or another, because it just kind of blew my mind that, that these birds, which I'd seen around me all the time and never taken any notice of, could be so beautiful uh, and I, I guess that I, I'm there I am saying that that's my first encounter not quite my first because I'd had a bait somebody once bought me a baby starling I didn't really know it didn't even know it was a starling I didn't and I've got a photograph of it here on the kitchen wall sat on my back when I was 10 years old and my um, my father had let me keep it on, we fed it on bread and milk back then which of course is the most awful diet you could feed anything on but it was just what, what people did back in probably that would have been the 60s yeah late 60s that would have been and so so birds were a thing and I read everything I could find about birds and uh, and I became I became obsessed with them people started to bring me injured ones um injured ones that cats had caught and I'd do my best to make them better and I'd be upset if they died and of course most of them did die because I didn't know what I was doing didn't know anybody else at school I was considered a, the bird freak you, you know that that's what I said and that and so I taught myself about birds really just from bird books from the library and uh from the all the injured birds that I had and so I had fairly good ID skills on most of them but for my 14th birthday, my dad bought me a book on falconry. It was Philip Glacier's book, uh, As the Falcon Her Bells. And I read that from cover to cover. And, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do what that bloke did. I wanted to have a relationship with birds. But all birds were cool. But birds who actually hunted, that was about as cool as you were going to get. So, so I just... I, I, I got books from the library, some I never did return, some are still here in my bathroom on the shelf. This was so long ago. Um, but I didn't know any other falconers in town. But um, 
when I was 16, somebody bought me an injured kestrel. They were bringing, people bring me injured birds all the time. Injured kestrel, that was the first one I ever had. And I loved that. And I kept it in my bedroom. My mother was fine about the animals. My, bed, my bedroom was full of animals. I had pet swallows and toads and lizards and grass snakes. I wanted to keep and learn about these things at close quarters, but birds of prey were always at the very top of the list. And my mother, I can remember being upset because of course the kestrel would poo all over the place and it would poo on the sideboard and, they, and I didn't know about them, but the droppings were like acid and they'd eat through the varnish and ruin the furniture in my bedroom. Anyway, so birds of prey were really, all birds, I love them all, but birds of prey were really my passion right from the start. But at school, I found it very difficult to concentrate. I didn't leave school with very much in the way of qualifications. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Being a professional falconer wasn't really an option back then. There, were, there was only one bird of prey centre in the whole country. And I was nothing like brave enough. To, and that was, of course, run by Philip Glacier, who had written the book that uh, my father had got me for my 14th birthday. But I was... I was nothing like uh, brave enough to write him a letter and ask for a, a position. I was just a, a boy in the council estate. Why would he even think twice about offering me work? So I kind of drifted. When I left school, I kind of drifted. I was into hunting. Uh, you know, I had ferrets. I was into rabbiting. Uh, we had lurches in the house. So I was into lamping and hunting. And, that, and of course, doing that, you learn a certain amount about field craft which later on came in very handy for falconry, for hunting. So wildlife, hunting, birds of prey, my mind was full of these things. And I taught myself taxidermy as well from um, books from the library in the same way as I taught myself about birds. And I made a reasonable living out of taxidermy as a young man. And I drifted and I, and I worked for a couple of years with the travellers who lived near us. And I really kind of just bounced about no real no real idea about my future my father um who'd left when I was very young I went to stay with him every now and again but he is a biophysicist he's a scientist so of course he'd always wanted me to go into medicine but I'd left school with almost no qualifications I had no interest in people at all it was animals and wildlife for me which my father who's still alive now and he's 80 he never really understood back then and in fact it's only in recent years he's come to understand what my life is all about. Anyway, I jump ahead. So, so I drifted around and uh, an uncle of mine had told me that he was thinking about doing a course at a local college, Otley College in Suffolk. He wanted to do a course in horticulture. And I thought that interesting that would keep me outside that would perhaps allow me to have a dog with me at all times um perhaps I should apply for a position uh, and do that because I had absolutely no idea no real direction in my life at all and um I applied for a position at the college for the horticulture course there were no places left but they informed me there's one place left on the agriculture course so I took that uh, and I loved it I was the only person on the whole course I was, I think I was 20, I was in my early 20s at that time. I was the oldest person on the course and I was the only person there who wasn't a farmer's son or a farmer's daughter. So I had no preconceived ideas about any of it, about anything to do with agriculture. I couldn't even drive a tractor at that time, but I really enjoyed it for the first time. Although I hadn't enjoyed school at all, for the first time in my life, I enjoyed learning partly no doubt because some of the teachers there were extraordinary and they really knew how to engage us. It was, a, it was so, such a different experience to school. Um, we had, the, the college had its own farm there where of course we would learn our stock tasks, we'd learn how to inject piglets and uh, trim their teeth or that you know, was back in the days of farrowing crates and you'd learn tasks with calves and, uh, and arable. And I, I loved it, I really enjoyed it. Of course, um, I earned a grant back then, but money was still quite tight. And the college offered me work in the morning before college. It means starting at six. They offered me work on the farm um, in the morning before college started. And they offered me work in the evening after college finished. And so I jumped at 
that opportunity and I really enjoyed it and I, I got on very well with the head stockman there. And then when the course finished, I, I got an award as top student, which I really loved. And I can remember they offered me, we went to prize giving at the end of the course, they offered me a selection of prizes and the prize I picked was a book on training sheepdogs. Now I'd never had a sheepdog. I had no uh, idea that becoming a shepherd was something I was likely to do, but this was dogs and dogs I loved, training dogs I loved, working dogs I loved. So I thought, I'll get that, maybe one day it will come in handy. And uh, of course I didn't realize just how handy that really would be. So at the end of the college course, they offered me a position as assistant stockman on the farm. And, and I love that. This was a proper job where I was valued, where I was working with animals and learning new stuff every day. And as time went on, part of my job was to teach stock tasks to other students who were coming in behind me. Students, uh, tasks like castration of piglets, which is a really funny one because I can remember the first time I'd ever seen piglets be castrated it. It kind of makes you go a little bit wobbly on the knees. So you'd always have to have chairs there for, um, for the boys. The boys particularly would find it very difficult to watch. And I can remember teaching, uh, teaching uh, castration to students. And um, sometimes the boys would pass out, which was, quite, which was quite amusing. Anyway, so I worked there. And I was at that time, at that time, I was living in a little cottage in the middle of the woods, right next to the college itself. And uh, that cottage was owned by a rich banker who lived in London. Uh, the stockman who was there, Henry Kemp, his name was, marvellous bloke, taught me so much about managing animals on a farm. Oh, and I, I had hawks then. I had hawks of my own. I had a little sports car and my sparrowhawk would come to work with me every day, sat on the passenger seat of the sparrowhawk and I would, in the pig unit, we had straw bales up along the top of where the pigs are kept and I'd put the bow perch up there. And then at dinner time, I'd go in um, with some members of staff who thought it was great fun and we would hunt blackbirds in the fruit garden. And they were, they were very successful and it was great fun. And of course, with students going through all days and a, biggie, a busy pig unit, the sparrowhawk, it kept the sparrowhawk really steady. So I loved that. So there I was living in this little cottage and there was a knock on the door one day and it was the banker, Charles Barrington, his name was, uh, the fellow I, who owned the cottage that I lived in. He said, David, my wife and I are thinking of buying a farm on the Isle of Mull off the west coast of Scotland. It's a 2000 acre farm. It's mostly sheep, but some cattle. Would you uh, consider taking on the position as, as um, farm manager? And I said, yes, straight away. I didn't even need to think about it. Now I'd never been to Scotland, but I knew the hunting was good up there. And I knew I could have some fun with a hawk. I knew I could. Um, the all I knew about Scotland was that it was wide open and beautiful and I'd seen Brigadoon when I was a lad and then you know it was just magical and I thought I could handle a bit of that uh, so I took the position I drove up with my car Sparrowhawk in the back and went and had a look around before um, I moved in to take over the farm and on my very first day there we were uh, the, the farmer who I stayed with was, was dipping sheep on uh, in the sheep dip down by the beach and it was the only sheep dip in the area. That was back when it was compulsory to dip sheep twice a year. It was the law. And it was the only sheep dip on that part of the island. And this was the southeast tip of the island, southwest tip of the island. And so people were bringing lots of sheep in. And we were there dipping them. And a golden eagle sailed right over the top of us. And I'd never seen a golden eagle, not in the wild, not in captivity. And... Um, I was absolutely speechless for a moment. And I said to the farmer, oh my God, that's a golden eagle. And he looked up and looked back at me. Yeah, we see them every day. And I had to leave him right there, dipping sheep on his own and drive back to the farmhouse and phone all my friends. It was pre-internet, no way to contact them. And uh, I knew he was quite right. Every day we saw them, every day, uh, white tailed sea eagles and golden eagles. But on the beach were a nesting pair of chuffs there were ravens. I'd never seen ravens before growing up in Suffolk. It was like something that was like a fairy tale. And rabbits. I have never seen so many rabbits in all my life. I'd take, I'd take the dog for a walk and you'd kick any clump of rushes and rabbits would run out. 
and it was paradise. And I'd go for a walk behind the farmhouse up on the hill and there would be mountain hares running around and grouse and hen harriers uh, and short-eared owls. It was magical, absolutely magical. So I thought, yeah, this is the place for me. So settled all my affairs in Suffolk, moved over there, took over the farm. Uh, I hacked my sparrowhawk back to the wild, that one back then. This was, you know, we're talking a long time ago. That would have been the late eighties. Um, and I took over the farm and I got myself a red tail and I hunted mountain hares and rabbits. I had an old lurcher at that time, he was 11 years old and we caught so many rabbits, so many rabbits. At 11 years old, I can remember going out lamping with her on her own one night when she was 11 years old and she caught 33 rabbits on the lamp in one night. So many I couldn't carry them, so many I had to put, put them in piles and then go back to the car drive around and pick them up there were so many rabbits there and then and for a few years it was it was paradise and so th I look back really fondly on my time on Mull. I loved it and also growing up in Suffolk of course we had the North Sea all around which looks a bit like pea soup but up there on Mull on a sunny day the water was blue like the Mediterranean and I had no idea that the sea was like that. I thought I thought you had to go abroad for that kind of sea. And so I can remember being on top of a mountain, listening to music on my Walkman, because Walkmans were a thing back then, and thinking that I had died and gone to heaven. Uh, so a great time, great time up there. And mostly hunting with, with the red tail. And I imprinted another sparrowhawk up there. And I hunted, uh, I hunted migrant birds in the autumn. and had great, just a great time. And I made some really good lifelong friends, but the winters were tough. I suffered where I'd come from was one of the driest counties in the UK up there in the winter. My God, it rains. And in my God, in the winter, the in the summer, it's dry. It's light for 24 hours a day, but in the winter it is really dark. And after three years, I decided probably time for a move. And my girlfriend's mother at the time sent me an article from a paper that said planning permission was being sought for a bird of prey center at Huntley on the east coast of Scotland. And this was, there would have been 92, 92 perhaps, something like that. So early days of falconry centers. And I wrote a letter to, I wrote a letter to the fellow who'd applied for planning permission, giving my experience and saying I would really like to um, work at a bird of prey centre and learn how to do flying displays you know I would really love that so he asked me to go for an interview I went over for an, for an interview and it turns out that he'd grown up in the same council estate as me he'd become rich by buying defunct oil rigs and pulling them apart and sell, selling all the pieces off but he'd, he'd become quite wealthy and he'd out there and he'd got a big farm was building this falconry center but what he was after he said he said i want you for the job but i want you to run the farm that surrounds the bird of prey center i said he said i've got enough falconers i want you to run the farm that surrounds it and it was arable and and cattle and there was a, a deer park on there farming red deer and a fly fishing trout farm i knew nothing i'd never caught fish in my life but i said yeah fine if somebody's prepared to teach me i would take on the job so um i took it on and i ran that and the falconry center itself was in its infancy and the falconer there in shane is a good friend of mine and he taught me how to do fl my first flying space and i can remember the first i can remember first, because i was a confident bird trainer i was a confident falconer but doing displays is a whole different skill altogether and i can remember he kind of put me on the spot dave you're doing the next show there's the bird go pick it up you're doing the next show and i was i'm not ready i am not ready there's only a few dozen people and i can remember standing out there in front of this crowd and my knees were shaking and and i needed a wee and and i stuttered and i couldn't get and i was terrified i was terrified but i got through and the bird messed me about and it was it was embarrassing and hard and um so I can, I can never do that again. But they were doing five shows a day at that time. Two hours later, he said, Dave, you're up again. Two or three days of that, 
and my knees had stopped shaking and I could talk properly. And, um, and I knew that's what I had to do. I knew, I knew that's what I had to do. So anyway, I ran the farm for a few years um, and I helped out with the bird of prey center as much as I could. But um, the, eventually he decided the man who owned the farm was going to sell the farm. And so my job was coming to an end. So I went back to Suffolk for a bit. And I got a really good sheepdog at that time, a really good sheepdog who'd come with me from the Isle of Mull. And um, I put an advert in Farmers Weekly, because again, this was before the internet. Um, I put an advert in the Farmers Weekly, experienced shepherd with a good dog, seeks a lambing position. And I'd been in Scotland all this time, and I decided I wanted to head to the southwest of England where the climate was gentler. Um, and the very first phone call I had was to offer me the job on Lundy Island, uh, which is just off the North Devon coast here. And of course, I, in all the falconry books I'd read, because back then, when I was a boy getting my falconry books from the library, many of the falconry books that I were reading were written 100 years ago. And peregrine falcons were never, were never something that really had interested me a lot because they were birds for rich people. How was a lad like me from a council estate ever going to afford a peregrine falcon? Um, but I'd read the chapters on peregrines and they always spoke about Lundy peregrines. They were, these things were birds of myth and legend. So to work on Lundy Island and get to see this mythical strain of peregrine, I jumped at the chance, went out there and stayed out there for a couple of years. And that too was a magic experience because there's all the electricity goes off at midnight. There's a pub that would stay open all night if you were prepared to drink all night. And again, there were ravens and there were peregrine falcons. It turns out that the original strain of peregrine falcons that lived there died out in the 60s thanks to DDT poisoning. But peregrines had moved out there again as populations had increased. And I got to see these marvellous birds flying around me all day as I was out there. And we had about a thousand sheep there and it is just the most beautiful magical place it is like turning the clock back 300 years and that's where and I met my second wife so I was out there for, for a year and a half or so I had no birds I had a break from bird to prey when I was out there I was just too busy to fly one um, so I came I met my second wife there after I left London actually I met my second wife there, but before we got married, after I left, I left Lundy Island after a year and a half, and I went back up to Scotland to run the very centre that I'd learned to give displays at, because by then the falconers who were there had moved on, somebody new had bought it. Um, he'd contacted me on Lundy Island to see if I wanted the job of running this centre. And of course I did. I would have sold my grandmother for an opportunity like that. So I had a, one, one of my sisters came up and worked as my assistant because it was quite busy doing five demonstrations every day. And there I worked for a year and there I kind of honed my craft of managing a big group of birds. And I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed rearing the youngsters, training because there was a lot of birds there, a lot of birds there who'd been trained before and handled by lots of different people and I enjoyed those birds but I really enjoyed the bond I had with the birds that I reared from for myself and imprinted myself and that is where I first started hacking birds giving them free time as they were growing up and I found that uh, I could give them lots of free time uh, but when they started to um, get into trouble turning up in people's gardens or if they started killing when they're out I'd have to stop the hack time, bring them back in and their serious training would go. But that is where, that is where I first started to get interested in long-term hacking of birds. And my attitude to hacking those birds was, kind of came from my youth, uh, from the growing up in Suffolk, from having the, the pet jackdaws and the magpies and uh, things, because I used to do the same with, with those. So I would hack them. I, I was only a boy and I didn't even I didn't know what hacking was about but I found I could leave my bedroom window open all day while I was at school and the birds could go off and do their own thing and they would come back to the bedroom window in the evening to be fed um, or at dinner time if I nipped home so 
I kind of always, always hacked birds, not always birds of prey, but I'd hacked birds and got away with it as a boy. So working at the Falconry Centre, the, the Northeast Falconry Centre at Huntley, that's where I really, really started my thoughts about hacking. So I did, I did a year up there and, uh, and I decided to marry the girl I'd met on Lundy Island. And um, we kept in contact. She'd come up and stayed with me in Scotland. And so we both moved here to North Devon. Funnily enough, we lived in a caravan for five years, a caravan right on the edge of the cliff where I could see Lundy Island, which is just 11 miles off the coast. And the caravan was called Lundy View. So um, it's, it's just inc an incredible coincidence how it all worked out. Anyway, so we there, we, we bought a house, uh, we reared a couple of, kid i i did demonstrations at a local zoo um, for a while and i traveled all over the southwest doing flying displays with my team of birds then um, i also uh, and, uh, and that i did for a few years and then i applied for a job for the local council as the animal welfare officer and i took that job uh, just in time for foot and mouth to rear its ugly head so I was the council's animal welfare officer through the foot and mouth crisis that we had down here, which made the, do the job really quite difficult. But I, all through this time, I had birds of my own course. Um, and I knew about the Bird of Prey Centre at the Milky Way Adventure Park down here, um, here in North Devon. It was a very small Bird of Prey Centre, very well designed, to be run by one person. I, mean, I knew the falconer there quite well. And I knew the employers, and these are good, good local employers with a terrific reputation. And I always said to them, if anything ever happens to the falconer who's here, I would really love this position. I'd really love that job. And as time went on, I remember receiving a phone call from the employer. It would have been 2000, New Year 2001, 20 years ago. Uh, they said, Dave, if you're still interested in that job, it's yours. So I left the council, took over the Bird of Prey Centre here at the Milky Way, and I've been there for the last 20 years. Uh, and I started, I just had three birds of my own. There's only enough space there for 15 birds. It's very small, like I say, designed to be run by one person. So I started with three birds I brought with me and have built it up over the course of the last 20 years. Um, rearing all my birds from scratch, imprinting all of them and hacking all of them too, every single one. Um, and some of my birds I have hacked long time. I have a, for example, I have a Jersaker who I bought from somebody in the first year I was at the Milky Way. And um, this bird had been flown to the lure before, um, a parent reared, and I have hacked that bird for two hours a day every day through the course of the summer from easter to the end of october for 20 years so he's into the routine now where i let him go at one o'clock in the afternoon and he turns up to start my three o'clock demo and he's done that six days a week every day of the summer for 20 years he's 24 now and that isn't that just amazing and he's so into this routine He's so into this routine. He has such a perfect body clock that he will sometimes turn up at 2.55 right overhead, ready to start the bird show five minutes before. He is so well conditioned to turn up at that time that occasionally, and this only happens once or twice a year, he turns up with a full crop where he's caught himself a crow, gorged on it, and still turned up in time to start the demo. Isn't that just amazing? But, um, but I've, hacked, I've hacked them all. The Harris Hawks, and they're all imprints. Every, all the birds I have now are imprints, and I hack everything. And I get them all into a little time slot. Because these birds, they have the most incredible body clocks. And our, we do too. We just mostly forget how to use ours, and we rely on phones and watches. But um, so I can, when I'm open to, to the public from east to the end of October, throughout the course of the day, the birds have their, their own individual hack slots. So I let them go at a certain time and they turn up at a certain time. And very, very rarely does that ever go wrong. Uh, but then there are some birds that 
for example, there are some birds I can no longer hack, peregrine falcons. The peregrine population around here has increased so much in the time that I've been working up at the Milky Way that um, they make my, hacking of my trained peregrine very difficult. So I can no longer hack him. But as a youngster, would hack him all the time. Uh, but now they can be quite dangerous, especially at this time of year where they'll come in looking for trouble. That, uh, my New Zealand falcon, who I, I hope to talk to you about in a bit, um, he has survived being hacked every day of his life. He, I, I hack summer and winter, but he understands peregrines really well. And he will sometimes chase them off out of the sky, but when they mean business, he heads for cover really fast and he knows. And well, touch wood, so far so good. In fact, just the day before yesterday, he was out at a hack in the morning about 10 o'clock. I could see him up about 200 feet doing his little courtship dance that he does in the spring. And I saw a peregrine falcon coming in towards him from much higher, stooping in towards him. And he corkscrewed down into the trees and only made it by the skin of his teeth. Now I was lucky to have witnessed that, but that must happen really regularly to him when he's out there on his own. And of course, GPS has made the hacking of my birds much easier. I have a Chilean blue, uh, you know, black chested buzzard eagle. I hacked him when he was very young as well. And in recent years, the GPS, uh, Marshall GPS that I use, that's kind of made hacking much easier because the Jer Saker, he's hacked for these two hours. I never knew where he went. I always, I never knew where he went for his two hours. I always knew he'd turn up at three o'clock, but God knows where he is. Now with GPS, I can see exactly where he is. I can see, and he has the same pattern. He goes to the same places, all dependent on the wind direction. If the wind's in the north, he heads to the coast. If the wind's in the south, we'll go inland. And I can, I can follow him on the GPS. So in my workshop at the Bird of Prey Centre, I have a big TV screen and I can beam the signal from my phone to the TV screen. So the public who come in, uh, they come in to watch the demos, they come in and look at look my artwork around the, um, the, the centre, they can see him too. On, they can see exactly where he is. And they are very impressed that, I, that I, I, I can say, oh, look, there's one of our birds and they can watch it on the screen. And as it approaches three o'clock, they can watch him make his way back. And sometimes he might cover, in those two hours, he might cover 25 miles. And he's 24 years old now and still doing demos and still standing up at three o'clock. That, you know, that's mind blowing for me, what I can do. But I'm very lucky because the center is perfectly located. We're in a very rural location, 700 feet above sea level. So we have lift all around us. Um, yeah, so yeah, hacking is, hacking is the thing. And that, and that is something I really have been able to indulge in my 20 years at North Devon Bird of Prey Center. Pushing the envelope a bit, just seeing what I can get away with in terms of tame hack. Yeah, but, but the one I've hacked the longest was three years old when I got him and parent reared. So it's not, it's not imprinting that makes a difference. It's that, to me anyway, it's that routine. It's that daily routine. And I don't have any volunteers. I don't have, you, it was very kind of you to call me a head falconer. I'm actually the only falconer there. I've, I have in the past had people who come in and work for me just on my day off to give me time away. But um, I don't even do that anymore. I, I do it all myself. So, and also I don't use scales. I haven't, I don't even own a set of scales anymore. So I haven't weighed a bird for probably 15 years now. So it's all about appetite and routine for me. It's all about appetite and routine. And because I'm, because it's only me, because I'm not sharing responsibility with anybody else, and because I'm spending nine hours a day with these birds, I am tuned into them. And I am watching the subtle clues they're giving me all the time. And because they're free lofted rather than tethered, I can in the morning when I go into their enclosure, tell by their reaction to me and my fist, whether they're spot on in condition or a little bit too hungry, or a little bit too high in condition. And, you know, 20 years on, it works. It works really well, yeah. So, so, that, so that's where I am. And now I live, I live down here, about two miles away from the Bird of Prey Centre. I live in, 
in this unique little village called Clavelli. You might have heard of it, but it's on it's on a 45 degree angle. You have to park half a mile away at the top of the um, you have to park at the top of the hill in the car park, and you have to walk down here. So all our furniture and our groceries come down on a sledge. You have to tow a sledge down the cobbles. But just like Lundy Island, it is like it is like life 300 years ago. It's a very small, tight knit community. I can see the sea from every window in my house, and it is that blue Mediterranean sea that I first saw on the Isle of Mull all those years ago, not the green pea soup of the North Sea. And I have a peregrine nest just to the right of the village, another one to the left. We've got ravens down here, gannets. We get porpoises and dolphins here in the bay. So, yeah, and I paint. I haven't even talked to you about painting yet, but, yeah, so it's a good life, yeah. yeah. But it's taken me a long time to get here and travelling around, yeah. Can yeah. you talk, David, about the, the theory of hacking and also you've got this fantastic bird, the New Zealand falcon. You're the first person I've spoken to with a New Zealand falcon. Can you talk yeah. about the lore of the New Zealand falcon? Why are they so special? Ah, yes, of course. When I was, when I was up at the uh, Northeast Falconry Centre, uh, all those years ago in Scotland, um, somebody uh, offered to sell us a New Zealand falcon uh, up there, and I'd never seen one in the flesh, but I'd read about these birds before. I'd only read very, very short bits about them. In fact, it was in a Jemima Perry Jones book, and she had just a short chapter on New Zealand falcons, and she said that this was probably the most versatile falcon in the world. Uh, and that intrigued me, that intrigued me, because sparrowhawks have always been my passion sparrowhawks have been the one bird that i've really really enjoyed hunting with but the sparrowhawks are hard work they're highly strong they're temperamental they don't tend to last very long they'll collide with fences they'll hit windows they live they're on a knife edge all the time but that was the type of hunting that really interested me the uh that type of fast moving hunting I really like. So I've always, my whole ultimate career, been looking for a good alternative to a sparrow, hawk. something like a sparrow, hawk, but not quite, not quite the hard work. And a few birds over the years, over the research I did, a few birds, including reading this information that Jemima Perry Jones about, a few birds kind of ticked those boxes. One was a red headed merlin, which I really like the sound of, because they were like our merlin, but but slightly more sparrowhawk-like in style. And the other one was the New Zealand falcon. Well, back then, Nick Fox was breeding a few. And these birds are special because where they've evolved in New Zealand, they have very little in the way of competition. There are no peregrine falcons there, no goshawks, no sparrowhawks. There's, there's the harrier and there's the New Zealand falcon. And the New Zealand, fal uh, and New Zealand itself has terrain very similar to the UK. Um, and this bird has evolved with no competition and it's evolved to become versatile, to do what peregrine can do, to do what a merlin can do, to do what a sparrowhawk can do, to do what a goshawk can do. And there's also a big clue in the huge sexual dimorphism. The female is like twice the size of a male. And that is always a good sign. That is always a, a good sign if you're looking for a rapacious, good hunting bird. So this species always intrigued me. So the opportunity to work with one came up with me in Scotland. And this was a three-year-old bird that had never been flown, never been handled. So I got, I trained him and I got him flying the lure, which he did moderately well. And then I'd take him out hunting small birds in around the hedgerows. And he was really successful and incredibly tame. He was successful, but he always didn't sit, he didn't want to sit on my hand. He wanted to ride around on my head while I beat it. Uh, while well, I was beating the, the hedgerows. And this turned out to be something of a character trait with all of them. And the interesting thing was that he would zip off my head, catch a small bird, hide it in the undergrowth and come back to, come back to my head. And he would want to go hunting again. He had, once this thing was dead and he didn't, he got no interest in it at all. And that was really interesting to me because this was, a, this was, nothing, this was nothing to do with food. So what was this about? What was this about? And, Turns out 
to, for me, it was about the partnership. It was about the fun. It was about just being out there and him enjoying himself. And he was desperate to come out hunting with me. And I loved this bird. But when I left the centre in Scotland, I asked the boss if I could buy it, take it with me. And he, and he was not prepared to sell it. Because it, it turns out a year later, New Zealand falcon stopped becoming available anyway. There were some problems with the breeding project or, or some of the birds in the breeding project. And for 20 odd years, New Zealand falcons were completely unavailable. So I'd had this, I had this short experience with a, this fascinating New Zealand falcon in Scotland. And I really wanted to, I really wanted to another chance. Now that I'm an older and more experienced falcon, I really wanted to try that again, see what these birds could do. And, and I put my name down on a waiting list that in about 1991 for, for a New Zealand falcon, but they were completely unavailable. Anyway, just four years ago, they became available again. Nick Fox had built up his breeding stock so much that he was prepared to let a few males go, only males. Uh, and I put my name down and I pestered, I pestered them so they wouldn't forget that I wanted one of these birds. And in that time, my very good friend, John Byrne, he'd got one. Uh, and this was a young imprint that was just growing up and I was so jealous. And I couldn't believe he got one before I had. When I'd been waiting for one since 1991. So I tested Nick Fox's crew and eventually they said, there's a chick here if you want it. Drove to Wales, picked this thing up, bought, put it back. And uh, you know, I've had pointers and spaniels and, even my colleagues, my old farm colleagues, would work with a hawk. They would know the difference between working sheep and working with a hawk. They pointed well when we were working with a hawk and they rounded up sheep and cattle like I wanted them to do. But uh, at this time, so when I got the New Zealand falcon, I had just the really old Vizsla. And my old Vizsla, of course, would work, would work um, pheasants and it would work rabbits but it's really going to be no good for the small birds that I wanted to hunt the New Zealand falcon so I got myself a Patterdale terrier and as a boy when I was in, really into hunting I'd, I completely forgot to mention that when I was a teenager I also used to hunt koi pews but on the broads where I grew up we had uh, thousands of acres of broads and there was a big population of koi pews they're you know they're like rats but like that big and they lived on they they were imported from South America for the fur trade. The bottom had fallen out of the fur trade. They'd released these things onto the broads and they'd grown to epic proportions. So I would hunt them as a boy with the terriers and my mum would cook them for, my money was tight, my mum would cook them for us. Um, and I wanted to see whether I could work a terrier with the New Zealand folk and I was fairly convinced I could. So I got myself a paddle pretty much the same time as I got the young New Zealand folk and so these were reared together. And yeah, it's been everything. He has been exactly what I wanted. He is like a sparrowhawk. He will do what a sparrowhawk can do and more. Um, and he has that same thing when we're out hunting. Occasionally we'll catch big stuff like the, you know, like magpies and partridge and find and it's just traditional. He'll just sit on them and let me pick him up. But when we're hunting small birds, which is really what, under license of course, which is really what I enjoy most of all, he'll catch them and he'll hide them and he'll come back to my head and he'll want to go on for the next one exactly like my old one used to do and this is a character trait of the male New Zealand falcon it, it turns out and of course I see where he's hidden his prize he's back on my head and me and the dog will go over find the prize put it in a bag and I'd feed it to him when I when we get back to the center so so it's incredible so yeah so this bird so we um, you know I've I've got a couple of YouTube videos of hunting with him. It's not quite like hunting anything else because I, because he, I have hacked every single day of his life, summer and winter, even, even growing up. And my, my hacking with him started when he was just a tiny downy. And in the morning, while I'm cleaning out all the other birds, I would put him in a tray in the middle of the falconry lawn. So even before he could fly, he got used to the environment and what was going on. And then as soon as he could get up onto a railing, I'd attach telemetry to him. But he too, I have got into this routine of turning up at a specific time for his uh, food. So I hack him every day.
but even when I'm hunting, I hack him. I hack him in the morning and we hunt in the afternoon. So I can I let him go in the morning and he'll go off and he'll do his thing. And then when it's time to go hunting, I pick up my stick and the dog. We head out towards the fields and we've got 100 acres of rough ground around where I work, which is usually which is our hunting ground. It's all I really need for him. And he will, when he sees me with the stick and the dog, he'll just turn up, land on my head and we're out hunting. So no weighing, no whistling, no nothing. He's just there. And he's like a boomerang. He'll go off. If he misses it, he'll just swing right back, back on my head. And it's good because it's treeless environment. So it's not, you know, it's not like he's, he can find a better perch elsewhere. So, and it also leaves both hands free for me. It means I can beat with one hand and film with the other. So it's, it's perfect. So this, so this is incredible. So this is a hunting bird. He's hunted now for four seasons for me and hacked every day of his life. And occasionally he will kill for himself when he's out at hack, but he won't eat it. He'll just catch it, hide it somewhere and then still come hunting with me. So it's a fairly unique relationship, but, but it's partly unique because he's a New Zealand falcon. I couldn't get away with that. I couldn't imagine quite getting away with that with any other species of bird. So he is magic. And so I got hack him in the morning and go hunting with him in the afternoon, in the winter time, in the hunting season. In the summer, uh, he'll, I'll hack him in the morning, and he'll turn up and he'll do my demonstrations because he is the most amazing lure bird, um, the most amazing lure bird. Uh, and he flies quite unlike anything else I've ever seen. Straight up, and straight down, like a little pocket rocket. And he can change speed in a spook, which makes swinging the lure for him really difficult. But yeah, he's magic. And I've got plenty of video of that out there too. And it's at uh, this time of year, he, I, when I hack him, I let him go in the morning, he goes straight up to, I don't know, five, six, seven hundred feet. And he's doing a courtship display, flying around in the sky. Um, and it's just lovely to watch. So he's fit as a fiddle. Uh, and he's free lofted, like all my birds. So he, and he's actually never tethered. Um, so he's free lofted all the time, uh, keeps himself perfectly well. So he's, he's a really remarkable bird. And when we're out in the hunting field, he doesn't want food. I can offer him food on my fist. He'll just come when I call him, but he won't eat the tip bit. He waits until we have walked back to the center and he goes back into his pen with whatever he's caught. And um, if I need to make his grub up, um, he has that too. So yeah, so that is his life. So he, so and he's four and still going strong. And he interacts daily with the buzzards and he, he'll fly, he'll dry, he can drive a buzzard off while swearing at them. Uh, he's very confident around them. Peregrines, as I've explained, if they're not in hunting mode, he will go up and he will do his best to drive them off. If they mean business, he'll head for the trees, which is clever. Kept him alive for four years. And we have, our skies around here are pretty thick with peregrines. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's the bird I've waited my whole lifetime to get. Here's the bird that um, uh, um, everything I've ever learned in my falconry life and career has gone into him. So he's kind of, you know, special to me. Yeah, I'm, so I'm very, very fun to him, as you can probably tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then there's painting, and I love painting him too. And I, I don't know anybody else at the moment who, um, who hunts with one. So, so it's great. It's great because, you know, hunted with gossel. I've, I've never been into big falcons. You know, I, I've got flown for my demos, but I've never been into hunting, game hawking with big falcons. Um, but I've flown goshawks and stuff, but that does, they don't really interest me anymore. But the, the news to find, to be able to fly something like that, so unusual and so incredibly unique has been a real privilege. I'm very fond of it. And I, and I paint too, of course, now which I haven't even spoken about, um, but I love painting him most of all, yeah. David, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I just talked to you very, just quickly about the painting itself. I, when I was at school, I actually failed O-level art. I always enjoyed drawing when I was a boy, but all I ever wanted to draw as a boy was birds. And my art teachers, they wanted me to paint 
and draw bowls of fruit and shoes and stuff like that. And oh my God, I got no dinosaurs or birds of prey. That's what I, so I failed, go level up. How you can do that, I've got no idea. But then when I was on Lundy Island, 1993, the electricity goes off late at night. There is nothing to do in the evening except sit in the pub or listen to the radio. So it was there I started to draw just out of my head, just the, um, because there were no smartphones back then, there's no internet, just the places that I lived in and loved. The mulch, I would draw my farm, I draw the marshes where I used to go hunting. Um, and it really, I think the left side of my brain woke up. 29 years old, stuck on an island, the left side of my brain suddenly activated itself. And my stepmother, God bless her, she's dead now, but um, I set, would send her one or two of these pictures and she sent me a book on painting with acrylic paints. And that was it. And I painted ever since nonstop. And, um, and I love it. Um, I'm, and I'm good at it now. And I, and I sell lots of stuff and I have a six month waiting list and birds, of course, are what I love to paint, uh, but I paint people and horses and dogs and landscapes too. And that is, I feel really good about that because, you know, we're all here for a short time. But that, I feel, is something that I can leave behind. Yeah, my bird pictures. So, yeah. So if I'm not flying birds, if I'm not up at Milky Way flying my birds, I'm here, sat at this table with the wood burner going, a glass of whiskey paintbrush in my hand and I'm a lucky man it's taken me 58 years to get here but um you know magic <laughs> David Rampling head falconer at the North Devon Bird of Prey Centre thank you very much for being on the program oh, my pleasure I hope I haven't I hope I haven't bored anybody it's nice to get it all out and and put it and I've never before in my life put it in order like that so it's been it's been fascinating for me too so thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. Bye.